Tonight, we will explore the personality, the identity, and the behavior of that woman in Parshas Shmois, whom the Torah does not identify by name. She is one of the most unexpected heroes in the entire Tanakh. Without her, Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, might not have lived, and thus the Jewish people would not be liberated, would not be molded into a nation, would not be given the Torah. In other words, without this particular hero, Judaism and the Jewish people may have never emerged. The whole story of history would have been changed. And yet, this woman is not Jewish. She is not an Israelite. She does not belong to the family of the Hebrews. She has nothing to gain by her act, but she has everything to lose, including her own life and future. This is an act of enormous courage. And yet, it seems that she has no doubts no misgivings. She doesn't question herself. She doesn't have any hesitation. It was Paroi, the emperor of Egypt, who afflicted and persecuted the Jewish people, who decreed that every Jewish boy should be drowned in the Nile River, and yet there was another member of his own family, of Paroi's own family, who saved the Jewish people. And this person is none other than Bas Pare, than the daughter of Pare. Not a sibling, not a grandchild, not a relative, but the very daughter of the king, the very daughter of Pare. Let us recall the context articulated in Parsha Shmois. Pare has decreed death for every male Jewish child. Yocheved, Amram's wife, had a baby boy. For three months she was able to conceal his existence so that the Egyptians do not take this little boy and plunge him into the Nile River as it was the fate of so many other Jewish, Yiddish, Kinderlach, Jewish children. But for no longer, the three months are up and she cannot conceal him no longer, fearing his certain death if she kept him. She set him afloat on the Nile in a basket, hoping against hope that someone might see him and someone might take pity on him. Maybe the miracle will occur and her little three-month-old baby would be saved. And this is what follows in Parsha Shmois. Vatered bas Pare lirchets alayoir. Pare's daughter went to bathe in the Nile. Venare so hilchus alyad hayoir. While her maids walked along the Nile's edge. Vateres hateva betoy chasuf. She saw the box, the casket, in the reeds. Vatishlach es amosa vatikocheha. She sent her slave girl. To fetch it. Vatiftach vatireu es hayeled vihine nar boich. She opens the box and she sees the boy. And she sees a lad weeping. Vatachmoil alof. She has pity on him. Vatoymer miyaldia ivrimze. She says, This is one of the Hebrew boys. Then there is a conversation between her. And Moshe's sister Miriam, who is standing nearby to see what will happen to her brother. Ultimately, the daughter of Paroi agrees that she brings a Jewish woman to nurse this baby. Of course, the woman she brings is his very own mother, Yechevet. And ultimately, the story concludes that the daughter of Paroi takes him. Vayihila lebein, he becomes a son for her. 
And she even gives him his name, Moshe. Because I have drawn him from the water. Now let's understand some components and some aspects of this story. Number one, the Torah doesn't give us a name. But the Torah gives us a title. The daughter of Parai. This was no ordinary woman who had compassion. Vateret Bas Parai, the daughter of Parai, the daughter of the father. The very human being who decreed that every Jewish male child should be thrown into the Nile, should be drowned in the water, and thus ultimately exterminate this nation as part of the genocide plan, the first final solution in history that Pyre devised against the Jewish people, his very daughter betrays him. Just to understand what this means, instead of reading Pyre's daughter, read Hitler's daughter. Read Stalin's daughter, and we begin to understand what is at stake. The woman who grew up in Paris Palace, who lives in Paris Palace, not only is she not affected by the moral depravity of her father and of the toxic environment in which she was raised, but she engages in an act which might spell her certain death. The ancient pharaohs, like many ancient kings, Kings cared little about their children. Often they would slaughter their own children. Pharaoh would have no qualms killing his daughter, murdering his daughter for what she has done, betraying the king in such a chutzpah, with such a, with, in such chutzpah, with such audacity. And yet the daughter of Parai does not care. She does not hesitate. She takes the casket. She opens it up. She knows it's a Jewish child. And she saves him and she brings him into the palace and she raises him. The Rok HaTshover Gaon, Rabbi Yosef Rosen, in Sofnas Paneach, presents a very interesting commentary in the story. He notes a contradiction in a nuanced detail. Moshe's mother could not hide him. For three months she can't hide him. After three months she can't hide him. She fears that now he's going to die. So she puts him in a basket. But where does she place the basket? In the beginning of the story, we read, She places him in a basket at the edge of the river. The Targum, the Aramaic Unculus translation says, Al Kaif Nahara, at the edge of the river which means apparently that the basket was not actually submerged in the river. It was not placed on the river, on the water, but rather in the dry land right at the edge of the river, al Kefnar, at the edge of the river. And yet later in the story, when the daughter of Pharaoh comes to bathe, she sees the basket betoy chasuf. Now the basket is in the river. It's not anymore al svas at the edge of the river. Now it's in the river. And the Rogachover tries to understand what changes in the story. In fact, when she names Moshe, Moshe, Kimin Hamayim is she I name him Moshe because I have drawn him from the water. In other words, he was not in a basket near the water, he was in a basket in the water. What happens in the story? Why the change? And why does the Torah emphasize this change? And the Ragachav Egon, in his own style, explains the following idea. He quotes the Gemara Mesech Tesoyte, which explains the Pasuk, it says that Pharaoh's daughter went out to bathe at the river. And he explains that it doesn't only mean, the Gemara says, it doesn't only mean physically she wanted to bathe. This day she decided to go bathe in the river. Rather, it means Lirchitz Migilule Aviha. She wanted to cleanse herself, bathe herself, purge herself from the idolatry of her father. It's known, our rabbis say, our sages say, that the primary idol of the Egyptians at the time was the Nile River. In fact, in Egypt, no rain, their sustenance came from the Nile River, and they worshipped the Nile River as a god. The god of the water, the god of the Nile, this was the god. They worshipped the Nile as their god. 
So the Ragachava says when Yoicheved wanted to conceal her son, she would not use the water because the water was Avaidizur. The water was an idol. The water was idolatry. So even to save her child, the Jew does not use Avaidizur, does not use idolatry even to save his or her life. So she would not use the water. She places the basket at the edge of the water. Once, however, the daughter of Pare came to bathe herself in the river. How would bathing in the river cleanse her from the idolatry of her father? Explains the Rakachover a brilliant idea. There's a concept called bitul avaydazara, which means if a non-Jew designates a particular statue or a particular object, whatever it may be, as an idol, as a deity, as a god, and worships it. How does that get nullified? How can you remove from it the status of avodah of idolatry? There has to be something called bitul avodah You have to nullify it, and it can only be done through the non-Jew. The non-Jew comes and nullifies it, deems it insignificant, says this is garbage, this is no God, this is no deity. Now the Jew can use it. Now you can buy it, now you can sell it, now you could benefit from it. Pharaoh's daughter comes to submerge and bathe herself in the Nile as an act of defiance, as stating that this is insignificant as a god. This is no god, this is a river. It's part of nature created by God, orchestrated by God, designed by God. But nature ought not to be worshipped. There is a force beyond nature. There's a force which conceived and brought nature into existence. Now, the water is not Avedizara anymore. She did bitl Avedizara. Now... The basket can float into the water. The basket is in the water. Because now Moshe, the child, can benefit from the water. Why not? It's not Avay Dezara any longer. It's interesting, Reb Mordechai Benet, quoted in Pardis Yosef, says that the reason that there is a Jewish custom that on the holiday of Shavuos, we decorate homes and synagogues with fresh leaves from the water or fresh branches he says, because Moshe Rabbeinu, Chazal tell us, the Gemara says in Megillah, he was born on the seventh day of Adar. For three months, his mother concealed him. After the three months, she places him near the water. Three months after the month of Adar, so he says, Nisan, Iyer, Sivan, it was the holiday of Shavuos. It was Shavuos when the daughter of Pare came to cleanse herself from the idolatry of her father. That day would later become the day when Hashem would reveal Himself to the world and to the Jewish people, Anoichi Hashem Alekech, I'm your God, and give them the Torah, the first one to celebrate, to commemorate, to tune into the energy of that day was the daughter of Parai. That's the day she nullified the Avedah Zorah, and according to Mardechai Benet, that's the reason that we decorate the shuls and the homes and Jewish communities on Shavuos with branches of trees and leaves that grow near the water to commemorate that moment when Moshe Rabbeinu was there at the edge of the river when his mother concealed. Now the Gemara says in Mesech Tesaita, the Gemara brings an argument, there's two opinions. What is the meaning of Atishlach es Amosa v'atikacheyu? She stretched out her ama and she took the basket and she liberated the child. And the Gemara brings two opinions. It is an argument between Reb Nechemia and Reb Yehuda. Reb Nechemia says, the literal translation, the daughter of Pare sent Amasa, her maidservant, her slave girl, to go take the basket. Rabbi Yehuda disagrees with Reb Nechemia in Mesech Tesoite, Daf Yedbeiz Amidbeiz. Reb Yehuda says that she actually stretched out her arm she stretched out her arm to take the basket on her own, not using her maid. So the Gemara says, why doesn't it say Yada? According to Rabbi Yehuda, why doesn't it say Vatishlach es Yada? She stretched out her hand. And the Gemara explains that according to Rabbi Yehuda, her hand, actually her arm, did not reach the basket. A miracle happened. Yada her hand, her arm extended. It extended so now she can reach the basket and draw Moshe from the water. Vatishlach es amasa, amasa, which is a size, around a foot and a half, a, Q, a certain size in Hebrew. Vatishlach es amasa, her arm stretched out, amais rabbis, into a larger, to a longer size so that she can 
she can rescue Moshe Rabbeinu. What is the message behind this argument? We understand the literal explanation. She sends her mate. But Rabbi Huda says, no, it was her arm. And her arm could not reach the basket and a miracle happened. So it's quoted in Hasidic works in the name of Rabbi Simcha Binim of Pshischa and other great tzaddikim that this actually represents another very powerful component in the story. Sometimes a person is confronted with an opportunity. And when you see the circumstances, you tell yourself clearly there's nothing you can do. It is impossible under natural circumstances that you can succeed. Comes the Torah and tells us, What you ought to do is stretch out your arm and let heaven do the rest. In life, I don't always have the power to see within my own potential and resources how I can save the situation, how I can rescue the child and ultimately change history. What I ought to do is vatishlechesamasa, you stretch out your arm. You become determined to do everything you can. You stretch out your arm in its full length. Don't hesitate. Don't be paralyzed. Don't stop. Open your heart. Open your arm. Open your mouth. Open your mind. Stretch out your arm. If need be, God will take your arm and stretch it longer and ultimately get the job done. So the story of the daughter of Parai is not that she actually saved the child. Not that she actually lifted the basket. She couldn't reach it. But rather, according to this explanation, it was about her attempt, her willingness, her resolve, her commitment. The effort that she put in in stretching out her arm. That is really the story which saves Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest Jew in history, the one who gives the Jewish people the Torah, gives them their spiritual mandate, the blueprint for the whole world for life. Now when we look at the story, we notice that she opens the basket. Vatireyu esayelet, she sees the child vihine nar boicha. There's a young lad weeping. She feels bad for him. She has compassion. Vatoymer, she says, This is a Jewish child. He is a Hebrew boy. How did she know? How did she know that this child is Jewish? The Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, gives the simple explanation. She understood very clearly that he's Jewish from the fact that he's in a basket at the Nile River. Who, besides a Jewish mother, would place their child there? For what purpose? As the Ramban puts it, she meditated, she reflected on the story, and she realized that the Jewish mother was scared that the child will be taken from her arms and plunged into the river. So she placed him in the basket, either so that he might be saved, or that she should not witness the actual death of the child, as in the story with Hagar and Yishmael in the book of Genesis and Bereshis, when Hagar moves away, she says, I don't want to see the death of the child when there was no water. An Egyptian father or mother, why would they place their child there? So therefore, she understood that this was a Jewish boy. The Gemara Mesech Tesoyted Af Yidbeiz Amidbeiz gives us another explanation. Rabbi Yossi, the son of Hanina, says, Shira Sa'isi Mol, she saw that he was circumcised. This is also quoted in the Yevon Ezra, in the Rashbam. The Rashbam writes that she saw that this was a male, and she saw that he had a bris, he was circumcised, and she understood that he was a Jewish child. In the last generations, there was given another explanation, how she knew he was a Jewish child. And although it's homiletical and somewhat anecdotal, but in fact... The ones who said this found a source for it in the reading of the text. Because when you read the text, there is a question. She opens the basket. She sees the child crying. Do you see a child crying or do you hear a child crying? Weeping, crying is something we would expect. The Torah would say, she hears that he is crying. Vatireyu esayelet, she sees the child, and he's weeping. 
She sees his tears. What is the meaning in that? And one of the great Hasidic masters explained that by seeing and not hearing, she understood that this is a Jewish child. She saw him weeping, but she did not hear him weeping. Because a Jewish child knows how to weep silently. You may not hear anything, but she saw the tears. It may even be that this is somewhat intimated in the Gemara. The Gemara in Saitid Afyid Bey's poses a contradiction. Vatireyu is hayelet. She sees a child. Vihine nar boicha. And a youth is weeping. Is he a yelled or a nar? A yelled is an infant, a little child. A nar is a teenager, a grown up child. Is he a yelled or a nar? Rabbi Yehuda says, Who yelled? He was a child, but his voice, he sounded like an adult, like a teenager. Reb Nechemye disagrees with Reb Yehuda. Reb Nechemye says, You're turning him into a blemished child, that his, his voice, as a three-month-old baby, already sounded like an adult. It seems like a good question. It may be what Reb Yehuda means is, he is a child, yelled, but koiloi kenar. But his voice is like a nar, like an adult which knows how to control himself or herself and not cry in a way that we can hear it. It's not audible. You have to be able to see it. This explanation arouses a very tragic association with the Holocaust. One cannot ignore the natural association with the many horrible episodes about the various actions which the Germans performed in the ghettos in which Jewish children from a very young age were taught to cry silently and never ever to cry in a loud voice so that the Germans would not find them in their hiding, and transport them to the death camps. After the Holocaust, one of the fighters in the Kovner ghetto in Lithuania, Abba Kovner, told the story of a young girl who was hiding in the Kovner ghetto for a very long time. And ultimately, she and her mother were saved. And after the war, when they came out from their hiding, she turned to her mother and says, Mama, Jetzt kemen schon weinen. Mother, now may I cry. So in this sense, the daughter of Parai sees in Moshe the child which captures and encapsulates one of the great tragedies of Jewish history. That sometimes the tears, the pain, the suffering would be so deep that these children could not scream They could not express it fully. They could not expose it. They're not even given the dignity of suffering. They have to bury it. They have to repress it. They have to hold it inside in order to be able to to continue their lives. And how many children of Holocaust survivors or of other Jews who suffer tremendously, their children and grandchildren, describe the difficulty of growing up in such a home. And yet many of these people could not survive in any other way. They knew that if the main commandment that they have is to continue life, to recreate life, to bring new families into the world, to raise new children, to raise children in a world, in a post-war world, the tremendous pain must be stored somewhere in the depth of their consciousness so that their faith and commitment and resolve to the future can come out. In this sense, Vatireyu, she saw the child weeping. A tremendous lesson in life. Sometimes you meet somebody, you look at them, they're not crying. If you listen to them, they're not crying. But take a look at them. 
Sometimes you have to be able to sense the pain beneath the surface, to sense the pain, the confusion, the fear beneath the conscious self, and to be able to be attentive to it, and to be able to us to develop compassion as the daughter of Pari did, saving this child from death. And now we come to the name. Who was this person? The Chumash doesn't give us a name. The daughter of Pare, that's enough. That tells the story. She was the daughter of Pare. But in Medrash, our rabbis figure out who this person was. In Vayikra Rabbah, in the beginning of Medrash Rabbah, Vayikra, Reb Simen, in the name of Reb Yeshua ben Levi, Reb Chama, the father of Reb Yeshua, in the name of Rebbe, send us to a verse in Divrei Hayomim in Chronicles. Ve'ishtoi ha his Jewish wife, gave birth to Yered, Avi, Goder, Chaver, Avi, Seicha, Yukusil, Ela Bnei Batya Basparoi. These are the children of Basya, Batya, the daughter of Paroi, Asheloka Chmered, who married married. This is in uh, Chronicles 1, Divrei Hayomim Aleph, chapter 4. And the Gemara, the Medrash in Vayikra identifies Ishto Yeha Yehudiya Zu Yechevet. His Jewish wife is Yechevet. And the children she gives birth to are different names for Yoldes, Yered, Avi. She gave birth to the same person. These are the different names of Moshe Rabbeinu. Ela Bnei Basia Bas the daughter, the sons of Pare, of Basia, because Basia is the daughter of Pare who saved Moshe and raised him and therefore Moshe is considered her child. And the Medrash continues. Omar la Kadish Baruch Hula Basya Shal Pare. God told Batsya, the daughter of Pare, Moshe was not your son, but you called him your son. Af at loyat biti vani kaira aischa biti. Batya. Moshe was not your son, but you made him your son. You called him your son. Vayihi lola bain. An unnatural thing to occur. For Basia to turn Moshe into her son, as we said earlier, she absolutely endangered her whole life and future. The Shidduch, the relationship between Batya and Moshe, is the furthest, furthest thing we can imagine in the society, in the milieu in which they lived. Moshe is a hopeless infant, a three-month-old infant, part of a slaves who are destined to be destroyed in Egypt. Basia is the princess, the daughter of an emperor of Pari. Why would Basia take Moshe and turn Moshe, this helpless Jewish creature, into her child? But this was Basia. This is what she did. So God tells her, you're not my daughter. You're Pari's daughter. Pari represents a whole different Weltanschauung. For Pari, might is right. For Pari to destroy a nation just because you're threatened by them in your own imagination, that is the right thing to do. You're not my daughter, you're Pari's daughter. Vani is chabiti. You made Moshe your son, you're my daughter. Batya, she's God's daughter. And the Medrash continues and says, we see that Moshe had so many other names. Why does the Torah call him only with one name, Moshe? In Divri Ayaman we see he had many other names. We call him one name, Moshe, an Egyptian name, given to him by the princess, by the daughter of Parai. And the Medrash says, God told Moshe, Chayecha, I swear to you, for all the names that were given to you, I will call you by the name that Batya, the daughter of Parai, has given to you. It's her name that she gave to you, that becomes your name, that's my name. And this becomes his name, Moshe. This is the name in which she was known. It's interesting, the Chazal say that she married Mered. Chazal identify their Mered as Kolev ben Yefunesh and Morad ba'atzasa meraglim. 
Mered means rebelled. He betrayed, he rebelled. The advice, the scheme of the spies. When Moshe Rabbeinu later sends 12 spies to scout the land of Israel, 10 of them come back and dissuade the Jewish people from going into the land. Only two remain loyal to Moshe Rabbeinu's plan to enter into the land. One of them is Kalev, Morad. He has the courage to betray the Miraglim. So the Chazal say, Basia betrayed. Atzas Paroi, Kolev Morad Ba'atzas Miraglim. Basia, at a moment of truth, stood up to her father, and she betrayed the entire philosophy and cruel genocide of her father. Kolev, at another moment of truth, stood up to all of his buddies and colleagues, great men, and to an entire people. Vayas Kolev Esamani silenced the nation. He remained loyal to the mission statement of entering into the land of Israel, knowing that this is the mission of the Jewish people. This is some of what we can glean from various sources concerning the profile, the character, the personality of Basia, the daughter of Parah. In another event, of profound tragedy and pain, we encountered such a moment again. And interestingly, the child's name is Moshe too. A few thousand years after the story in Parsha Shmois, in a far home in Mumbai in India, Two terrorists walk into a home, into the Chabad house. Torture, murder. Innocent people, including the Chabad ambassadors to Mumbai, Reb Gavriel Noyach and Rivka Holzberg. And their maid, Sandra, is hiding in a room. She's hiding in a room throughout the night. And in the morning, she hears... She hears a sound, Sandra, Sandra, two-year-old Moshe Tzvi Holzberg. Both of his parents murdered in their own home in the Chabad house. Is calling out for Sandra. The person she was standing nearby, and the person sh whom she was standing near in the room, the person standing near her warned her, don't go. For you to go means literally subjecting yourself to death. Subjecting the child to death and through savage torture and suffering. But as Sandra described it later in her interviews, she couldn't resist. She says, who would, when you hear Sandra, Sandra, who would? And notwithstanding every human instinct that I want to save my own life, notwithstanding the logic of the human being, let me go run out of this house and save my own life. She runs up, she sees Moshe submerged in blood near the bodies of his mother and his father. And she takes Moshe and she saves him. And now she is with Moshe in his grandparents' home in Afula in Israel, in the homes of the Rosenberg, his mother's parents' home. Whereas the reports come from there, Moshe doesn't want to separate from her. This is his memory, this is what he has. A few thousand years later, in an isolated home, we have the story of, of Batya, of a daughter of God, of a non-Jewish woman, risking her own life in a very clear way to save another young Moshe, and generating such a sense of inspiration and thankfulness and gratefulness in hearts of not just the family, and not just the Chabad family, but the entire Jewish world, and in the hearts of all good people. When God turns to Basya, the first Basya, and says, you're my daughter. Batya, you're the daughter of God. But from this whole story, there's also a few lessons to us. Number one, great moments in history Sometimes the greatest moments of history don't necessarily occur in grandiose settings generated by governments, by kings, by queens, by great activists. Sometimes the greatest acts of history occur 
in a single instant, by a single individual, in an isolated location where you don't expect it. And not only that, sometimes what creates history is not even your action. It's your attempt to act. One moment, a princess is going to bathe. She sees a basket. And she made a choice. Let me save this child. And this changes history. And she couldn't even save him, but she stretches out her arm. She says, let me do what I can do. And in the eyes and the imagination of Tanakh, this is what defines history. Your attempt to stretch out your arm and save a child. And then there is the element of seeing the weeping of the child. You can't always hear. Sometimes it's so deep. Moshe Rabbeinu is encapsulating the pain of thousands and thousands of Jewish children. He can't cry. But look into his eyes and be sensitive to that. And then there is, of course, the major lesson and application of the story. Namely, sometimes the greatest gifts are discovered in the most unexpected people and places. If you were to ask, from whom would we expect such an act of courage? The last option would be Paroi's daughter. Paroi's daughter? is certainly Paroi's daughter, a product of Paroi. Comes the Torah and tells us, you don't know. Paroi was Paroi. Paroi's daughter was a daughter of God. Sometimes in the hearts of dark, in the heart of darkness, sometimes in the most unexpected of places or people, there is a spark. There is a sense of truth, of courage, of love, of compassion that's indescribable. And it's true about our lives as well. Sometimes we look into the mirror and we see ourselves as being slaves to Pyre and everything that Pyre represents. We become victims of our negative habits or addictions or instincts or behaviors. We become victims of paray on one level or another, psychological, emotional, spiritual. And therefore we judge ourselves in a particular way or we judge others in a particular way. But remember that sparks of truth are found everywhere. And the light of God and the light of compassion you can discover sometimes in the most unexpected people and places. You have to be open to it. You have to be sensitive to it and within yourself as well. You sometimes gaze at yourself and you may see shadows, skeletons, demons, ghosts. You're surrounded by Parai. And then it's time to remember that the daughter of Parai, who grew up with Parai, who was stuck in Parai's environment, at her moment, Vatishlech Hamasa, she stretched out her arm and she reshaped history. Good night.